thank you for having me. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I was invited here, uh, and I've only done this twice before. And in prep mode, I was kind of checking out the other talks. And I saw someone who played piano for Dalai Lama. And I was like, so why did they invite you? Why am I invited here? And I feel like that is one of the elements that you might recognize right straight from the bat, that whenever you're asked to do something, whenever you're invited to work on a project, when someone says, hey, I want to pay you to do this, you go like, but why are you asking me? And that's a very, that's the feeling that I kind of had when I was prepping. And I'm kind of okay in terms of nerves, most of the process of prep, but then I'm here and I see everyone walking in and I get a bit more shaky, more shaky. And at one point, there's always one point where I feel like I'm gonna pull an Adele. <laughs> Do you guys know what pulling an Adele is? Let me tell you, you don't, because I made that shit up last week. <laughs> you all know Adele, amazing singer-songwriter, but she's also known for her incredible performance anxiety. And there are a couple of stories about Adele where she gets so nervous that she just escapes the venue that she's supposed to perform at. She just leaves. She's like, well, I already have a million Grammys. Guess I'm gonna see if I can pop them, bye. She always returns at the 11th hour, which I find very reassuring. But there is a moment right before Adele, freaking Adele, goes on where she's just like, nope, can't do this, bye. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but when it comes to work, when it comes to creative things, there's always that moment where you're just like, fuck, I'm gonna pull an Adele. We don't, but we feel like we're gonna do that. Um, I felt like pulling an Adele, not just in the once or twice that I've done a talk, but when I was writing my master thesis and I was staring at the computer in terms of SPSS and statistical analysis <laughs> stuff, just like, nope, can't do this, four years, bye. Someone that I um, actually talk about this stuff with is my friend Alina, and Alina is a photographer, and in my mind, a great photographer. She does amazing stuff, weddings, portraits, products, projects, events, and she has made this picture. Now this picture is my favorite picture, not just of myself, but literally my favorite picture. And my idea would be that if I were Alina, I would just be like, yeah, I made someone's favorite thing, and I would never have to feel insecure again. I just Kanye West my way through life and just, yeah, I made someone's favorite thing, what's up? What can I do for you? <laughs> and maybe there's a coworker or a friend where you're looking at them and just like, if I did the stuff that you did, I'd never be insecure. But when it comes to yourself, it never feels that way. And when it comes to myself, I never feel that way. There's people that like the things that I write. There's people that like the things that I do. And when they tell me, I'm really happy about that, but it never really sticks, you know? It never really internalizes like, oh, I can do stuff. I'm pretty good at the things that I do. It just doesn't stick. Well, that's kind of the thing with anxiety that you get over the things that you want other people to like and that you kind of feel are important. Can someone give me a glass of water, by the way? <laughs> totally forgot, blanked out. So what I kind of wanted to talk to you about today is anxiety and the way that it kind of can affect you in terms of your work but also in your personal life and I'm going to use a personal experience but before I go on I kind of want to make the distinction between fear and anxiety <laughs> because in semantics it's kind of murky it's kind of convoluted but there is a difference so when I'm talking, I'm going to say I'm afraid of, or I was anxious of, and it's kind of going to sound like it's all the same, but it's not. Fear is a different species from anxiety. Fear is threat, immediate response. So a drunk homeless person is running towards me with a fork and he wants to stab me, or a car is approaching me at the fast and the furious type speeds, or oh no, I stepped on a snake in the jungle and it seems pissed off. Mm -hmm. That's fear, and you go... <gasps> and there's an immediate response, so fight, flight, or freeze. So in terms of the homeless man, if you think you can take him, sucker punch him. <laughs> if you think that you're fast enough to get out of the way of the car, then by God, please do it. And 
I don't know if a snake works the same way as a T-Rex, but stand still, <laughs> freeze. However, anxiety is not so much about the immediate threat. Anxiety is more about things that shouldn't be that big of a deal, but they feel like they are. They are about scenarios that might happen, and they're even about scenarios that are very, very unlikely to happen. But the problem is that even though fear and anxiety are about two different things, the underlying biological mechanism is kind of the same. You respond the same way, and the sucky thing with anxiety is, is that it lasts longer. So it's not the immediate threat, you respond and then you're done. Anxiety is something that you can take with you and have with you for way longer than you should. And that's exhausting and can really impair the way that you do things. <clears throat> and there's so many reasons in this life right now to be anxious about. Not so much fear, because there's not really any many life threats anymore. There's no mammoths or T-Rexes or like tigers that we have to run away from. It's more deadlines, people that said something mean to us, projects, um, pushy managers. There's more kind of that stuff instead of actual reasons to fear. And um, it would be so much easier if we didn't feel the anxiety, but anxiety is something that um, uh, we needed that before, you know? Before, like I was saying with the angry mammoths and the T-Rexes and the saber tooth tigers, which I know is not historically correct that they're all together, but you know, I just really <laughs> like the image of them all together and us running away from them. Um, there's not so much of that anymore, but the feeling is still the same. And there's one thing that is very, very prominent within especially creatives, especially in the millennials, and that's the following, the imposter syndrome. I'm sure that you've all heard about it, but I'm gonna explain it to you anyway. Um, the imposter syndrome is this thing where we're convinced that everybody else is wrong, and we are hired, but we don't know why, it must have been a fluke. We do things, but I'm sure that they're awful, and one day, one day they're gonna figure it out. One day they're gonna figure out that I'm a fraud, and that I'm not actually as good as they seem to think I am right now. That's what the imposter syndrome is. And if there's any industry where you can feel like that, it is in the creative industry, because there's always something to look at that makes you question everything that you have done, and you're just like, well, I guess everybody's wrong. This, uh, this is wrong, this is not supposed to be this way. Now, I am uh, a student counselor now, and before this, I worked at the university as a teacher and a coordinator, and I did a whole bunch of stuff. And <coughs> My imposter syndrome was super, super strong there. But I was an anxious person altogether. And I didn't really notice that I was an anxious person because I really didn't identify as an, as an anxious person. And that's kind of my own dumbness because I had this sort of stereotype of anxiety where it's for frail and delicate people who are sensitive and who are shaky. And I have a big mouth and I bullshit my way through things and I come across and I make, it, I make a joke and I, you know, so I, I didn't really think that there was all this anxiety inside of me, but there was, because I was afraid of really dumb things. For example, well, this is all the work stuff, obviously, but there was also so many things around it, like afraid to express my feelings to other people, because what if they would leave, or what if they would leave and take everybody else with them. Um, I think that the dumbest thing that I was afraid of, like when people invited me out for drinks, then I would, my mind would immediately go to, but what if I can get there because the subways aren't running? What if the bar is crowded? And what if they want to stay out really late and I want to go home early? Well, I don't know, take an Uber, go to a different bar, tell them to fuck off, what's the problem? <laughs> but to me at that time, it didn't really feel that way. I was kind of like one of those sea anemones, where when you look at it, it's sort of, <coughs> It's okay and it's fine, but the moment that it's poked with something, just goes. That was kind of the way that things were happening with me. And um, <clears throat> yes. <laughs> and with work, it was the worst because I worked at a university, and there's all these smart people there, and I'm smart, but not that smart. 
So I was constantly surrounded with people who were doing PhDs, postdocs, all these super, super smart people. And somehow I became convinced that I was hired as a fluke. They were just not paying attention. And one day I would make a giant mistake and they would figure it out and I would get fired. That was what was happening in my mind. So I'd be terrified to check my email because what if the email was finally there that I made a giant mistake and they would fire me? And I would be afraid to go into meetings because maybe that would be the meeting that they had figured out I'd make a giant mistake and fire me. And finally, and I'm kind of embarrassed that I have to admit this, but it's true, it would get so bad that I would actually stand in the doorway of my office and I would listen to my coworkers walking by, getting coffee, shooting the shit in the hallway. And I would stand there so worried that they were talking about me and how bad I was doing, how bad I was at my job. So there was already so much anxiety within me. I just didn't really connect with it. I didn't recognize it for what it was. But then there was something that gave me actual immediate threat reasons to be afraid. Have you ever been in a room with a crazy person? Well, and I don't mean this in any way as a derogatory term, because crazy is exactly what crazy is. You have lost touch with reality. You have no longer the same empathy and rationality, and there's something that's happened that made you crazy. And someone I cared about had gotten a little crazy. And I was in a room with that person for six hours. And something about the way that he saw the world just freaked me out. Because we no longer shared that same reality. He was gone, he was somewhere else. And what's worse is that that in itself I found very traumatizing for some reason. Which then embarrassed me because what the hell, I wasn't, it wasn't something horrible that happened, I wasn't assaulted. The only thing that happened, I was in a room for six hours with someone who was a bit crazy. And afterwards, because he was at that point a little crazy, um, he would text me and he would say really, really horrible things. And all that together kind of triggered, kind of threatened my sense of self, my sense of the world, my sense of safety. And um, I was really afraid, like actual fear. I was really afraid that he was going to hurt me, that something was going to happen, and that my actual safety was at risk. So, you know how I asked you if you were ever in a room with a crazy person? Mm -hmm. Well, if you were in a room with me after that, <laughs> you would have been in a room with a crazy person. Because I turned in this, into this adrenaline-fueled, hyper-vigilant, super-alert, startled at anything kind of person. I remember going to the movies with my friends and I would not move from the walls because I had to check the, I had to check the crowd just in case, just in case there was anything happening. So surprise, surprise, um, a little while later I was diagnosed with being overworked, which is kind of the, I'm going to say in sort of kindergarten terms, it's kind of the pre-stage before the burnout. Um, if you want to ask me more about that, we can talk about that later. Uh, and post-traumatic stress disorder. How fun! So fun. Um, and these diagnoses seem different at first glance. They seem like they are about two completely different things, but for me they weren't. They were both very much rooted in anxiety and fear. But that anxiety was the core of it all. The core was, oh shit, I can't do this, I'm not good enough, I'm afraid of everything that's, going, hap that's happening around me that I can't control and that there's so much to be afraid of in the world. So, it had already been inside me, but this event that happened kind of like triggered it out in the open. And you know what they say. The truth will set you free. First, it will put you in therapy. <laughs> so, my therapy wasn't that big of a deal. I just saw my psychologist um, once every three weeks. And uh, I remember the first time that I saw him, I was just like, oh, everything was wrong. And he just said, would you like me to be your, uh, your, your, your therapist? He was like, yeah. And he was like, oh, fun. And I was just like, <laughs> okay. But what started then was something that I wish I could convey onto all of you, but I can't all tell you to go in therapy because the mental health system is already pretty busted anyway. Um, but what happened after was like a long time where I 
had the therapy, but I also went a lot to yoga and I wrote so much, so much that I will never see the light of day, thank you very much. Um, like, it's a lot of soul searching and a whole journey and kind of like staring all that anxiety in the face and kind of looking into the abyss, as the writer once would say. And um, there's no way that I can share all of it, but I'm very happy to say is that I'm so much less anxious. And, you know, anxiety in itself is not your enemy. Anxiety is not something that you should have to kill on the inside. And fear and anxiety are a part of the emotional spectrum of us humans. And, you know, if you didn't feel that, I'd be kind of worried that you're either a robot or a psychopath. And in both cases, I'm kind of afraid you're going to take over the world. So, it's okay to have that, but it should never impair your functioning. It should not make you so, so unhappy. Because if that's the case, then that's worth investigating and it's worth tackling. So, for creative mornings, I kind of thought, okay, if I would have to share something that I hope is helpful, what would it be? So for the post-traumatic stress disorder, I got eye movement desensitization, reprocessing, EMDR, and a lot of writing. But for all the anxiety that I had about work, about other people, about all the random things that aren't that big of a deal or are imaginary, um, I did something that's called inquiry-based stress reduction, which is actually based on the work of a self-help author. So yay, that made me really happy. Um, it's based on the work, the work, of Byron Katie. I haven't read it myself, it's very bit woo woo, bit out there, but it's actually so good that the Dutch uh, psychologists are now using it within their sessions with people. And they're actually currently working on empirical research to support the fact that this actually really, really works. So, one thing that I started doing with my therapist and then after on my own is just asking myself a couple of questions. And the uh, IBSR also includes a whole thing about how something that you're thinking or how a scenario that you're thinking is going to happen, how that is making you feel, which is also really interesting because you can really see the connection with your thought and what happens afterwards on the insides. So whenever I'm afraid of something or whenever something's happening, I'm just like, is it true? Because a really big one for me during that period was, oh no, I'm overworked, I'm not working right now, I will never get another job. I will never get another job and I will end up living under a bridge in a box. I really was really, really afraid of that. And with my therapist, we sort of kind of tackled, okay, is that true? Is that really what would happen? And there would be a ton of reasons why that was a bit of an over-dramatization on my part. And it was just really interesting to sort of look at the things that I was imagining and just be like, okay, it's not very likely that it's going to happen. And this also applies to things that you think about yourself, like, I can't do this, which is something that we often think somewhere in the creative process, we're just like, nope, can't do this. But you've probably done it before. Same with handing in papers or making deadlines. So I can do this. Yes, you can. You've done this before. So is it true? Probably not. And another thing that's really ha really easy to remember, like whenever you're thinking about something and you're like, yeah, but is this really happening right now? Like, is this currently my reality that I should be anxious about or is this something that I'm imagining might happen later? So is it really useful to fear that right now? And another one is, um, is it likely that this is going to happen in the future? And for example, um, what if you've, you're a photographer and you've made a picture that someone doesn't like. And it's very easy to, to freak out over that. I can totally imagine that. And you're just like, oh my god, they hated my pictures. They're going to badmouth me to everyone and then I'm never going to get work again. Okay. A. If they would badmouth bad mouth you, would everyone believe it? Probably not. Even if everyone <coughs> believed the person that was badmouthing you, how many people would that be? Okay, so those people you've never worked with, but aren't there a lot of other people? Yeah, but what if it's just in this branch? Are you sure that it's, that it's all in this branch? Are you sure that there's not other people that you've been working with? If you kind of play out the scenario, you very often end up somewhere where just like, okay. And by all means, I'm not saying that this is foolproof and that it will work all the time. Some things are so deep within us that these three questions might not do the entire trick. 
but hopefully they'll help you calm down enough that you can actually keep going. One thing that I struggle with is perfectionism, and it's a very common problem, and a lot of us feel the need to do everything perfectly, but you can't. And I've made giant mistakes in the past, and I'm going to make giant mistakes in the future, and I sort of let go of the idea that I should do everything exactly as it should be, because I'm allowing all the other people around me to make mistakes. If a, if a colleague hands something in a little way, that's fine. If a student forgets to do something, I understand. So why can I not extend that same privilege to myself? I'm trying. I'm not always perfect with this, but I'm trying. And finally, I kind of decided that maybe I'm not the right person to judge other people's decision to have me speak somewhere or to ask me to create something for them or if they ask me if I want to run a project. Maybe that's for them to decide. They are grown people, they're adults, they make their own decisions and they have hopefully based their decision to ask me for something on the right things. And I'm not, apparently, I'm not a very objective person to judge myself. You automatically, and that's the same for you, you automatically see all the things you fucked up at before, and you see things why you shouldn't be something or shouldn't do something. So I kind of figure, you know what? That's for you guys. That's for you guys. If you ask me and I like the thing that you're asking me to do, then fine, I'll show up. And you know what? I'll show up and I'll just do the best that I can. And that's the thing that I kind of want to tell you to do too. Like, if you're asked to do something that kind of freaks you out, but they, you've been asked for and you like it, just show up and do the best you can. Thank you very much. So you're asking, okay, so we have anxiety, but what are the pluses of experiencing anxiety? Well, it's, I think it's kind of what I said before about um, anxiety and fear are a part of what we feel as humans because it guides us towards the, same, towards the right things most of the time. Um, and so if you feel a little bit anxious, sometimes it can boost your performance. It's kind of like, this, but that's always the um, short-term stress, not so much the long-term stress. Long-term stress is actually not very good for your body, not very good for your mind. Um, so a little bit of anxiety about things that matter to you because there's a lot of things that matter to us and of course we're going to feel anxious about the results, about people's opinions about it. That's fine, it just shouldn't be too big, you know? Yeah. Like I'm currently, oh sorry, yeah. No worries. Is it a less rational way of stopping your monologue when it's So you're asking for a less rational way to stop them. Well, um, <laughs> that's a really good question. So yeah. something more, <coughs> yeah. No, you're totally right. It's not something that you can just turn off with a deep breath and an affirmation. I wish, but unfortunately that's not the case. Um, one thing that I found really helpful is um, <coughs> doing anything else, but that sort of includes the body. So for me, yoga and act, it's kind of an active meditation that really works for me. Other people who are more able to do the passive meditation, but I'm kind of like, Bleh! so I'm not very good with the passive meditation yet. I'm practicing. So um, I find that it, you know, a yoga class or going for a walk or even doing anything that sort of helps you get your mind off things is the, the, the less rational way to sort of shut it down. and. Even if it's sort of in the back of your mind still, it's still helpful to do something else. Because if you weren't doing that, you'd be full on focused on the feelings, I think. Yeah. 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 If we put this uh, discussion in the triangle of the mental health, what yeah. do you think is the status in the Netherlands about this debate? Like it's something that is emerging, or it's something that it, people don't really connect with? Because for instance, in UK, there is even the real family talking about it really like to try to understand that it's not something that happens only if you are, as you say, crazy, but it's something that everyone experiences in different yeah. levels. Um, that's a good question. So you're kind of asking like, okay, what's the status in, in Dutch mental health? Yeah. Uh, also in the society. In the society. Or... Mm, I feel like we're making progress, but that's more in terms of like general mental health because there's been a lot of like, I feel like a lot of people are working on getting the stigmas um, taken away from the things like depression and, and anxiety disorders and all of that kind of stuff. I feel like we're making some progress. Um, in terms of anxiety, 
I haven't worked in that area to really make a like a an, um, how do you say that? I can't speak for the mental health in the Netherlands completely, um, but if I can talk from my experience with the therapist and with mental health care, I feel like they all they want to do is just help you deal with it. You know what I mean? So they're they are there to help you function better, and they are there to. And I, did, I didn't feel the judgment like, oh, you have an anxiety or so you're crazy. And when I use the word crazy, I don't mean it like a derogatory thing. Um, and I feel like, I thought it was, I think that the most, like the, mo the reason that people are there is, is to help them. And I didn't really notice that the stigma is becoming less. So does that answer your question? I feel like not answering. Yeah, I feel like there's definitely progress here and it's not so much a taboo anymore. That's my experience. Yeah. So since you work a lot with students, do you think there's a difference in coping with fear and anxiety for like teenagers, millennials versus adults? Um, oh, that's a really good question. Um, so if there's uh, if there's a difference in the way that they cope and if there should be, kind of. Um, I feel like it will always matter the way that you've grown up and the way that you've experienced the world. And there are generational differences. Um, in terms of the millennials that I see as students, um, what I see a lot, and maybe that's something that you can relate to as well, because I know that I do, there's a lot of students who just haven't really experienced setbacks as much as maybe other people who are older have done. Uh, I, for example, I just sort of skated on through, through with studying, except for the masterpieces. <coughs> and I know that I take failure and mistakes really, really hard. I just take it as such a personal, um, failing like it's not just I made a mistake or I uh, I fucked something up it's like no you're a fuck up you're, you did something wrong um, and I feel like that is something that's very common in um, in my generation but even the the even younger ones and sometimes when there's a student in front of me who's like freaking out over something um, it's because they just haven't had the experience of worse things yet which is on the one hand amazing and good for them because I want everyone to sort of skip through life on clouds and rainbows and all of that. But mistakes and fuck ups and failures and shitty things that happen can also really help you deal with it better. And I feel like younger people sometimes need to give, get a little bit more of that. That's, yeah. Does it answer your question? Yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 Like, so it's sort of a follow-up from that. Yeah. Do you think the, uh, like, for the millennials, they need to be validated more socially? We're becoming more of a... a like, I love social media, let that be out there, and I I always get really, like, eye rolly whenever someone goes, oh, I'm on a social media detox, I'm like, why are you talking about it on Twitter? Like, <laughs> that does not make sense, okay? Um, I think it's really healthy to sort of find validation around you in the offline world, because the online world can be created in any sort of which way, and that's great, but especially for young people, uh, young kids who don't know how much work there goes into a perfect Instagram feed or uh, the stories that people weave on social media. Um, it can kind of feel like you're making a mistake by not being that. You're failing because you're not that. Um, and I'm kind of curious, just like you, to see how that will affect them later. Yeah. Unfortunately, I think, yeah. <laughs> but uh, do you think there can be good sides as well to actually giving parts of yourself and going through the anxiety that you Absolutely. Might learn more about yourself? Absolutely. And I think that um, as I the experience that I had wasn't so much in terms of freelance and creative, but I went through like the worst of the anxiety that I had in me. And maybe that can be the same for people who work in the creative industry and as freelancers where you're so dependent on only you and the, pro the, the things that you make. Um, and I feel like you can take a pretty big hit when someone doesn't like something that you've made. You can take a pretty big, big hit when a company isn't happy with what you did. Um, and of course it's a learning experience and not everyone is always going to be thinking the sun shines up your ass. Um, so I feel like it can be definitely a learning process for yourself, as are all things as you go through them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, sure. uh, I would like to ask about your opinion how to realize the sources of anxiety to know how to fight it because I'm sure to a lot of people happening that sometimes you just can't fall asleep with your anxiety but you, I'm not sure why oh, yeah. and you cannot identify 
Yeah. Oh, that's a really good question. So you're asking, okay, yeah. you've, you've given all these reasons why I'm anxious, but what if I just feel anxious for no real reason, or at least not a reason that I can immediately identify? Um, I'm not sure if I can answer it perfectly, but one thing that I notice is that when I'm anxious and I don't know why, that there is a reason, I just don't know it yet. You know, and one thing that I find really helpful is to actually just sit down, get a cup of tea, and you know, if you're trying to fall asleep when you're, you you have that stressy, angst, angsty feeling, that doesn't work, so go out of bed and do something, or even just for five or ten minutes, and it might be easier to fall, fall asleep. Um, I just sort of sit down, and sometimes I just write, like, why am I so anxious, or what is giving me stress right now? And maybe that's a bit like the woo-woo side of me, but I believe there's so much happening in our, um, in our subconscious. There's so much turmoil all the time, and sometimes bubbles come up. And maybe you cannot always identify it, and maybe it will be a feeling that once triggered immensely, like the thing that I talked about with, um, uh, with that person, um, then maybe you'll figure it out. But sometimes we're anxious and we don't know yet. Yeah.